Welcome to our second HRD Talks episode. Today our speaker is Mr. Elkan Weinberg, the CEO of Adin Fine Vintage and Antique Jewelry Company. Hi Elkan, how are you? Thank you, I'm fine. Could you please tell us about your past and how did you discover your passion in antique jewelry? When I was six or seven years old, I developed an interest in enameling, enamel jewelry. And uh, not that my parents had anything to do with it, they were in textiles. And when I was 16, I heard about an education to become a goldsmith. So I took that education. And when I was 21, I was finished that education. Shortly after that, I had saved a little bit of money. I went to a jeweler, bought a little bit of pieces from a scrap silver that I could choose. And I went to a flea market. I used the tablecloth of my mother, pinned the silver pieces to it, and that's how I started. Uh, that must have been 1982 or something. And what makes antique jewelry so special, in your opinion? What makes antique jewelry so special is that mostly the better pieces, the higher quality pieces, they um, survive. Of course, there are a lower category of jewelry as well that survives, but the better pieces are more cared for. And the interesting thing in antique jewelry is that to find those better pieces, and when you look at them and you turn it around, because if you look at jewelry as an expert, the first thing is you turn the piece around. Look how the back is. Back is. Like a car uh, mechanic looks under the hood of a car, we look at the back of a piece. And you realize that it's made with more, more passion, more brightness in the, in the craftsmanship of the maker. And that's what I like about the antique jewelry. Would be a piece of jewel still considered antique if some stones or one stones are switched? Um, that's, that's a difficult question to answer because it de depends on the piece. When the stone that is switched is of uh, is the centerpiece of the the jewel itself, then it that's then it's a, a no go. But when it's just supporting like. A, uh, when it's on an unimportant place, like a side stone, for a instance. side stone, or then it's more likely to be accepted. Uh, accepted, mm -hmm. yes. So it can be accepted if it's course, not that much. Of course, of course, of course. It, 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 there are graduations. It's it's not black and white. There's a lot of grey in between. Yeah. What is the difference between vintage and antique jewelry? Um, to me, it's actually more a semantic question. To me. Uh, everything that's second-hand is vintage and antique is, per definition, second-hand. So, vintage is a chic way of saying that's second-hand. That's how I look at it. I'm sure there are other experts who will disagree with me, and, but anyway, this is my idea about it. Yeah, so like uh, you can't uh, say like that, that there is a certain border between these two definitions. So it's quite relative. I think so, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Does antique jewelry increase uh, its value with the time? And if yes, then uh, how much? I'm not so fond of using the argument that it increases in value. The most important thing I find to buy jewelry in general, whether it's antique or modern, you have to buy it with your heart. The most important is the emotional value which stands behind uh, any jewelry piece. Yes, the, the emotional value is, is, is to me the most important. If, if you, most of the times people buy jewelry, again whether it's antique or modern doesn't matter, but they buy it to, to remember a specific uh, moment in their life. And Okay, that can be a, a Christmas or a birthday or... A, a, a engagement. An engagement. And depending on the situation, the engagement happens, if you're lucky, just once in your life. So you can spend more money on it. But it will be the heirloom for your children. And they don't 
will, they won't keep that because of the value, because it's for mama and papa. When papa bought it for mama, when they got engaged, and the emotion is the most important factor in, in, in jewelry, I think. But what, what happens is, uh, as I told a little bit sooner, is um, the good pieces, they survive. So if you have an antique piece that is good, something that's good will remain good. Something that's just good because it's in fashion goes out of fashion. If it, and if it's out of fashion and not good, there's not much value there. But if you have a good piece from a certain era, it remains good and the value will increase because no more pieces are added. There only will be fewer, lesser and lesser pieces of it. So the value increases over time, but how much? It depends on, on, the, on the time as well, because if, for example, if you have a good Art Deco piece with pearls, and when pearls are f out of fashion for any reason, you, the Art Deco piece with pearls won't be in fashion anymore, so the value will go down as well a little bit. So there's not one line to say it will increase that much percentage over time. That's, it wouldn't be fair coming with a, 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 a straight answer to that. Mm -hmm. And what kind of antique or winter jewels are more popular or more desirable for customers? In general, you can say rings, are, they sell the best, no matter what style. Rings sell the best. Then you have uh, earrings, pendants, bracelets, brooches are very hard to sell. Although everybody in the trade is trying to revive the interest in, in brooches, but it's, those are very hard. Mm -hmm. I like to wear brooches myself as well, because those are real statement pieces. But the problem is that the textiles of these days are more thinner than they used to be in the, in the 50s or earlier. Okay. So if you have a, a brooch and it's too heavy, it, it won't look nice on your thin whatever it is you're wearing. Yeah, and it also can like uh, can make uh, small holes in You see, so that's yeah. that's one reason why people wouldn't wear it. Um, but that's in object terms. In style, um, I would say vintage, and not because people, uh, sorry, I would say Art Deco, and not because people like Art Deco so much, you know what it is, but a lot of people get there information from sources like Instagram and everybody, a lot of dealers call everything they have vintage. And um, so people are, they look at these pieces, they know it's vintage, it looks modern, and then they look for something antique because they want to be special. Because if you, if you dare to choose for antique jewelry, you show that you have a little bit of guts going your own direction. But because they have, um, they're limited in the education they had, so to say, in, um, in styles. They always refer to the modern styles. And to the modern styles, the closest nearby is the Art Deco period. Once they dive into it, they develop a taste to whatever they, it is they like. It can be Jugendstil, which is Art Nouveau, can be Retro, which is 50s, can be early Victorian, mid-Victorian, Georgian. But that's, it's like a, a good wine. You, you, you first taste a few wines and you don't like it, or perhaps you like it. But on the way, you, you develop a certain taste. And how to determine the quality of antique jewelry? Like, for instance, the quality, in terms of quality of uh, the craftsmanship? The first thing you do is you look how it is made. You don't look at uh, what sort of, you don't look at the value of the stones or the value of the material because anybody can use a big stone and everybody can use a kilo of gold but that doesn't make you a good goldsmith or a good designer so as, a, as an expert you look at the back side and the side of the piece the, the front side of the piece is to impress people and the back side of the piece is to impress the experts and when experts recognize it as a good quality, then it's good quality. There's not one line, because every piece you have to look at in a different way. But the experts, those who have seen a lot, 
they will can tell you per piece what to look at. Does uh, symbolism play an important role in uh, antique jewelry? The way I make my collection of antique jewelry is based uh, on the story the piece tells, not so much on the on a, a big stone or because that's to me that's not so so interesting. To me, what's interesting is the story a piece has to tell, and because of that, you will find a lot of pieces with symbolism in my collection. But it's not everybody looks at it that way. A lot of people just are happy to have a second hand or vintage piece on their finger. What I try to do is to add a little bit of the emotion to it by explaining what, what it means or can mean. Do you have some examples uh, of jewels where you can see, um, where you can observe a clear connection between jewelry design and fashion or symbolism of a certain period of time? This ring here. If you look at it, it's perhaps uh, a cute ring, a nice ring, or perhaps you don't like it. But you have to... Um, I will tell you what it is. And when I'll explain it to you, then you, there's a big chance you will look at it in a different way. And what's happening there in your mind is what I try to find the jewelry that establish such things. So the ring is nothing special or nice, but that's it. Let me explain. Around 1900 in England you had the suffragettes. Those were women who were fighting for the right for women to vote. And they had a credo. And this credo was, give women the vote. And the abbreviation for that is GWV. And to change this in the symbolism, they made it into green, white and violet. Green, white and violet. Now you wonder what does the yellow there? Exactly. All right. The yellow stands for the American suffragettes. They didn't have a real credo, but they had a, a song, the yellow ribbon. And what you see here is there's a combination of all those important colors to people, to the the insiders who know about it. And if you look at this ring now again, you get greedy. Yeah. I want to have it. Yes. And not because what it is, but, but because what it stands for. Yes. And that's what I like about old jewelry with the symbolism behind it. Yes. Because for instance, first time I took a look, for me there was just a ring with a different color gemstones and nothing more. Yeah. But now when you explained... You it's, want to have it. Yes. It, too, it's too late, it's old. Yeah. <laughs> what advice would you give to someone who, who decides to start uh, his own collection of uh, antique jewelry? Don't start, it's very addictive. Okay. <laughs> yes. No. Um, but anyway, even if somebody is not afraid to be addicted to antique jewels, uh, then which advice would you, would you give to that person? Um, Buy with your heart. Don't be afraid to make mistakes because you will make mistakes. But you need those mistakes to grow in your um, your uh, in your knowledge. Uh, that I have a nice collection means that I have made many many errors, which cost me a lot of money. But that's how you learn. And if you're afraid to drive a bicycle, don't drive a bicycle. You have to fall a few times to... Well, the thing is, you, you buy something. I bought something. Yeah. My first pendant in, in silver. I told you with... Uh, I was so proud. There was a, a, a little um, four-leaf clover with a woman's hat on it. It was the top of a medallion. So it was half a jewel and it was silver. I was so proud. I finally had something Art Nouveau. I, I was blind for the fact it was just part of it and that yeah. it was silver. And I was really very proud of it. I went to an expert and he looked at me and he, he dismissed me. <laughs> Go oh. away. <laughs> Later we became good friends, very good friends. And we, we still laugh about this story. 
And but you need, well, perhaps not with a, they, uh, with something like like that, but you need somebody to tell you, okay, it's not good because this and this and this. And when you had the nerve, when you had the guts to invest in a piece, then the piece is yours. And if you're open to the criticism why you shouldn't have bought it, then you grow. And another thing to make a good collection, get rid of the things you love. Because the moment the best pieces in your collection, try to get rid of them because it opens the door to a higher level of pieces that you're open to. Because you conquered a special level and if you, if you dare to abandon that level, then you can grow. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you stay on that level. So that means, uh, do you mean by that that it's not necessary like to keep uh, the, the first um, favorite um, Well, you can, keep, you, can, or... you can keep a piece as for sentimental reasons, yeah. my, my first mistake I made. I have on my desk, I have uh, a few plastic bags hanging with the mistakes I made. And they're hanging there for 30 years, reminding me I don't know everything. Yes. And okay. to keep sharp and to... Those are sentimental pieces, but um, unless you are an expert and really sure that the piece is good, um, try to get rid of the, the bottom of your collection and slowly by getting rid of the bottom, you add more pieces on the top and slowly what, what was on top eventually will add the bottom again. Mm -hmm. So you will grow, get rid, try to abandon. So just to keep uh, moving on. Me moving on, yes, yeah. and try to keep growing in what you are aiming for. And uh, what do you mean exactly by growing um, in your collection? That uh, you, to be able to spot very nice uh, pieces of antique jewels? Absolutely, or yes, yeah. yes. But, um, if you're if you narrow yourself down to those pieces that you bought and you you drill about it like it's it's your precious and mm -hmm. it's then you stick to it mm -hmm. and be open minded read go to museums and take the pieces in your hand just discover discover um, and, and look and look yeah. and uh, appreciate the old craftsmanship and when your eyes are opening because it you really there's, there are different ways to look at the piece, yeah. like uh, on the surface, like, like if, if you're a layman, you look, look at the ring at the top and the expert again looks at the back. But also in the back gives you a lot of information to appreciate or not. So when this is developing, then you will make a very nice collection. Is it true that you developed a unique website, antiquejewel.com, where you can find all the information about um, different antique jewelry styles? Um, even you have an ex real pictures of uh, real jewels Absolutely. from different uh, periods. And also you added some information about um, the symbolism behind them. Yes, yes, yes. Well, um the website used to be in four languages. I, my, I'm online since 1994 and my first online sale was in January 98. And in the beginning, our, my website was in four languages, uh, French, English, Dutch and Japanese. We abandoned Japanese because it's too much of a maintenance. And now with Google Translate, it, it doesn't matter what language anymore. So, but it's still in three languages. And without the descriptive pages of the jewels we sell, I still have seven, over 7,000 pages on my website. 7,000 pages? More than 7,000 pages. Don't worry, I, I won't ask you to read them all. It's, uh, but it's divided in three languages, so it's, but still a lot, still a lot. And uh, let's say there's an Aiden Academy. Uh, I give a lecture on antique jewelry and give you a little bit of in-depth information on how to look at things or symbolism. There's a huge glossary and huge is huge. Uh, and also interesting in the glossary there's a style overview where from the last 400 years in Europe from uh, the countries per 
time period. Mm -hmm. I explain what style there is and those styles are clickable mm -hmm. and are explained in, in the glossary as well. So um, it's, it's a, a very inter interesting read. Now besides that, the, the educational stuff, I try to have fun with the jewelry because as, as I said, jewelry should, should be fun. It's, it's an emotion. Yeah. And what do I do? Well, I, I try to make nice pictures. I play with it. I, and every week I send my customers a, a mail for which I especially make, uh, well, an artistic picture, so to say. And not only that, those pictures I turn into postcards, which I send to my customers as well. But besides those pictures, I also make little games that I send my customers on a, some regular basis. For children? Uh, for children? For children or adults who want to play. So there can be puzzles, there can be Sudoku, but all based on, on jewelry. But in this way, you also can learn something new. Correct. Correct. So, but I don't want to be too much of a teacher. The main thing I want to, that I want to spread out is the, the joy you can have with jewelry. Mm -hmm. Not, it, 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 of course, you have to be serious in what you sell and serious what, what you know. But it doesn't mean you can't have joy with it and, and pleasure. Yeah. So that's what I try to communicate. Thank you for this wonderful interview. There was a, I learned a lot about antique and vintage jewelry and I hope our audience will also discover something new in this uh, world of antique uh, jewelry. Thank you so much, Elkan. My pleasure. Thank you. And um, yeah, see you maybe next time. Okay. Thank you very Thank you. much.